Can everybody hear me if I talk at this volume? I don't have a mic, but he didn't either. So um, I'm Matt Zapatoski, like uh, Dr. Stewart mentioned. I'm a 2008 graduate of OU, and I now cover the Justice Department and the FBI for the Washington Post. And I'm honored to be here tonight to introduce my boss's 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 boss, <laughs> uh, the executive editor. So when I sat down to write out what I was going to say, my first thought was that I'd trace for you Marty's path from the Miami Herald to the Los Angeles Times to the New York Times to the Boston Globe, and then finally to the best newspaper in the country. <laughs> uh, I'd recount for you some of the Pulitzer Prize winning coverage that Marty has supervised, like OU grad Wes Lowry and others work on police shootings of black men. And I would, of course, tell you about the Oscar-winning movie, His Work Inspired. Uh, and that's, of course, Spotlight, the story of the Catholic Church's cover-up of a massive sex scandal, sex abuse scandal, uh, which Marty's team reported on when he was editor of the Globe. But you can find details on all of that, beyond what I've told you, with a quick Google search. Uh, and I think OU brought me here from DC <laughs> to tell you about what it's like to work for Marty and why he's so deserving of the recognition that he's going to receive tonight. Uh, Marty is a reporter's editor, a journalist who isn't driven by a desire for attention or accolades, though he's received plenty of both, but by the notion that he is on this earth to hold the powerful to account. Anyone who's worked in journalism has probably at some point answered to an editor whose skepticism can cloud their better judgment, or whose first reaction to a powerful story is to rationalize a subject's bad behavior, or to question whether the topic is even worth writing about. And that's not Marty. Don't get me wrong, Marty is skeptical. But he applies that skepticism to the specious claims of politicians and spokesmen, rather than to his own employees. When your assignment editor tells you Marty has a question on one of your stories, it usually means you'll have a whole new, more ambitious line of reporting. Uh, or it means you're finally going to have to confront that hole in the story you knew was there when you filed. Uh, a lot of you might have read online about the Washington Post's obsession with web traffic. And it's true. We are obsessed, and that's Marty's fault. <laughs> <laughs> But Marty's intense interest in unique visitors isn't some craven attempt to keep the people with the money happy, uh, nor does it come at the expense of important enterprise. I think the reason that Marty cares so much about our web hits is because he cares so much about our readers, and he wants to see as many of them as possible view our work. I'm going to tell one sort of personal story about Marty. Uh, and then I'll, I'll turn the mic over to him. Well, he already has the mic. Um, some years ago, I was covering uh, a public corruption case against the former governor of Virginia, Bob McDonald. And uh, prosecutors had mistakenly filed some documents that weren't properly redacted. We could see before they rushed to take these materials down that there was consternation about a juror who had been sleeping during the trial. Uh, believe it or not, there was actually debate about whether we should write about this, and our lawyers in particular felt that because there was a redaction mistake that we should show some deference to the court and not write anything. And I remember being on a conference call in this windowless office I used to work out of in the courthouse, feeling like I was losing the argument with, with our attorneys. And then in another office in DC, Marty walked in. And I don't remember exactly what he said, but he, something to the effect of a juror sleeping during the, one of the most high profile trials in our region is news, and we're writing about it. Um, it's that kind of no nonsense, news first attitude that makes Marty such a great editor. And it's the same value set that I think you guys here, students at OU, have. Um, I did a quick search of our directory before I came here, and there are 10, 10 Bobcats. Uh, working at the Washington Post right now, at least 10 that listed that in their, in their online biography. While Marty didn't hire them all, I think it says something that 10 people from one public college in Ohio ended up working for him. Uh, Bobcats are fearless. 
they're relentless, motivated by the journalism rather than accolade. They don't make big shows and meetings or write verbose, self-promoting memos. They just do the work. And that's Marty in a nutshell. I realize there is some irony in that Marty is here getting an award tonight, and I've just sung his praises in a speech that probably could have been more concise. <laughs> but uh, I think we can make an exception for just tonight. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce you all to Marty Baird. Uh, well, Matt, that was really that was really nice, really gracious, and I'm glad that you made the trip here. Uh, I was totally surprised when uh, Matt showed up, walked through the door uh, at the, um, uh, the lecture earlier to freshman class, and um, uh, but I'm I'm glad you did, even though uh, you really ought to be working. There's a lot of um, <laughs> a lot of important stories out there that uh, somehow are, you know don't have the benefit of your. Uh, attention at the moment so uh, but I'm really grateful that you uh, that you made those remarks and they were really gracious so uh, thanks a lot for to everybody uh, for coming here it's great to see so many people here um, I was in Athens actually in April uh, from my my nephew actually graduated uh, and so it's a pleasure to be back the accommodations for me this time are a lot better than they were the last time uh, <laughs> the, the place I stayed in had I think a, a rating on one of the rating services and the line was, uh, seemed fine to me, but I was only here for two hours. Um, <laughs> uh, and I wish I had only been there for two hours. So, um, so uh, it's a real honor to thank you for uh, selecting me for the Carvan Ando Award. Uh, you know, that's named after a journalist uh, of uh, supreme distinction. Uh, and, uh, and the award's been granted to a who's who in our, in our field. Uh, Anna became famous for making the tough call one day in April 1912 uh, that the Titanic was sinking. Uh, when other newspapers hesitated to say that flat out, uh, Anna, then, who, who was then the managing editor of the New York Times, looked at the evidence, concluded that it was clear, and declared that that news boldly on the front page in a big headline. Uh, so when the evidence was clear, he didn't waver. He wasn't timid and he did not flinch. You know, that willingness to publish what we plainly know to be true is a point that I want to get back to. And it's an important one for us, I think, all today. Uh, and it's one reason why I feel so privileged to have my name associated with Car Van Anda. So uh, let me start a little bit about uh, telling you about my own experiences uh, by, by recounting what happened to me earlier this year when I was at my own alma mater, Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, Lehigh hosted a screening of the movie Spotlight, and I was there to do a question and answer uh, session afterward, talking about the movie, of course, but also about the journalism that inspired it, how the Boston Globe had exposed a decades-long cover-up of sex abuse by clergy within the Archdiocese of Boston and the Catholic Church overall, an investigation that continues to reverberate across the world today. Shortly after questions from the audience got underway, an elderly gen gentleman rose to speak. And he said, it was a very hard movie for me to watch. I tried to see it a couple of times. I only got to the parking lot and turned around. I'm 80 plus years old. I was sexually abused by a priest in 1947. I was 11. I live with it every day. I was fatherless. I didn't know if anybody would believe me. I never spoke about it. My wife passed away many years ago. She never knew about it. It was in 47 he molested me, and he was ordained in 1947. Not a day goes by that I don't have to live with this. And in concluding, he said simply, I want to thank you very much. Thank you. It was not the first time since the movie's release that I had heard words like those, nor was it the first time since the Boston Globe pursued its investigation into the cover-up of abuse within the Boston Archdiocese that I had heard expressions of gratitude for that work. Their words that remind me of what must stay constant in my field of journalism. As you know, 
Journalism is in a period of upheaval. Much is changing and much will have to, but not everything should. And one thing that should remain the same is our mission. It's a mission that challenges all of us at the Washington Post every day as we walk into our newsroom. And it is articulated in a set of principles that were established in 1933 by a new owner for the Post, Eugene Meyer, whose family went on to publish the Post for 80 years. And the principles begin like this, and they're on the wall. The first mission of a newspaper is to tell the truth, as nearly as the truth may be ascertained. The public expects that of us. If we fail to pursue the truth and to tell it unflinchingly, because we're fearful that we'll be unpopular, or because powerful interests will oppose us, or because we worry about financial repercussions to advertising or subscriptions, the public will not forgive us. Nor, in my view, should they. When the Globe embarked on its investigation of the church, that institution was arguably the most powerful in all of New England. The major majority of residents in the Boston area are Catholic. The church's presence is everywhere. You can't walk a few blocks without seeing a parish church. But evidence of grievous wrongdoing in the Archdiocese of Boston had emerged. And when journalists have reason to suspect wrongdoing, we have no choice but to investigate. And if we can document the wrongdoing, we have no choice but to report it. And when we report it, we must do so without hesitation and without obfuscation. We must report it honestly and honorably and fairly and accurately. But we must also report it unflinchingly. I'm often asked why, after arriving in Boston in the summer of 2001, uh, that I decided to, quote, go after the Catholic Church. As I've said many times, I did not decide to go after the Catholic Church. I decided to go after a story. It was a journalistic impulse. I had arrived in Boston from Miami, where I had been editor of the Miami Herald. I came to the paper knowing no one there beyond two casual acquaintances. I had no friends in Boston beyond one couple I had not seen in years. I had been labeled an outsider in the city, not a newcomer. And by the way, vo vocabulary can say a lot about a place. For me, it was an awkward and uncomfortable time. All I knew of Boston really was what I had read. I had been diving into books furiously in the three weeks I had available to me between jobs. Books like Boston Catholics, A History of the Church and Its People, The Boston Irish, A Political History, Black Mass, The History of Mobster Whitey Bulger, and of course, Curse of the Bambino, the history of the decades-long losing streak for the Red Sox. Things like that, I was trying to get a feel for the place. But a day before I started work, I read something startling in the moment. It was a column in the Boston Globe itself, written by Eileen McNamara, a Pulitzer Prize winner. She wrote about the case of John Gagan. He was a priest. Gagan had been accused of abusing as many as 80 children. It was shocking. And I was surprised that a news junkie like me had not heard of it. So I read closely. And the column detailed how the attorney for the survivors, those victimized by that priest, had asserted that the cardinal himself, Cardinal Bernard Law, knew about this priest's repeated abuse and yet continued to re reassign him from one parish to the next notifying no one, not the parish priest, and certainly not the parishioners, that a priest known to have committed sexual assaults would serve in ministry at their church. Those were the allegations of the plaintiff's attorney. But the attorneys for the church called those allegations baseless and irresponsible, as Eileen noted. And then Eileen ended her column by saying, the truth might never be known because the internal church documents that could reveal the tr tr truth were under court seal, hidden from the public. So naturally, I wondered, who was telling the truth? 
the church, or the plaintiff's lawyer. And so when I attended my first morning news meeting at the Globe on my first day of work, I was waiting to hear that we were on to the story, trying to sort that out, to get to the bottom of it all. Because when the, someone says the truth may never be known, to me, that should be like chum for journalists. <laughs> but no one mentioned it. And so I asked whether we couldn't get at the truth, couldn't get past one side saying one thing and another saying just the opposite. And it was pointed out to me that the documents were under seal. I knew that. I had read it. And I said that while I didn't know the laws of Massachusetts, in Florida, where I'd been, we'd probably be inclined to try to unseal those documents had we thought of going to court to do that. We had not. So we promptly contacted our lawyer for his counsel about the possibility of filing a motion to unseal doc the documents. And in parallel, we launched members of the Spotlight team on an investigation. And they were off and running. And they did a brilliant job, digging with the kind of energy and determination that should be a model for any journalist. The first question we sought to answer, of course, was whether the Cardinal himself knew of this priest's abuse and yet reassigned him to other parishes despite consistently strong evidence of serial abuse of children. The answer to that question proved to be an unequivocal yes. We also wanted to know if there were other abusers like this priest. Beyond that was, and beyond that was concealing abuse and reassigning priests common practice. Was that the church's actual policy? Did the church knowingly place abusers into parishes where their history of abuse was unknown and where they abused again? And the answer to all those questions turned out to be an unequivocal yes. There were other abusers among the priesthood, many in fact. It had been common practice to conceal their abuse and to put them back into ministry. And yes, that was church policy and practice directed by the Cardinal himself. Our investigation began because we would not, could not, settle for the truth never being known. We sought to unearth the truth. That is what journalists do and must do. And the result was a public good. An institution was held accountable. Children were made more safe. Well after our first story was published in January 2002, I received a letter from Father Thomas P. Doyle, who had waged a long and lonely battle within the church on behalf of abuse victims. And he wrote this. This nightmare would have gone on and on were it not for you and the Globe staff, as one who has been deeply involved in fighting for justice for the victims and survivors for many years, I thank you with every part of my being. I assure you, he wrote, that what you and the Globe have done for the victims, the church and society, cannot be adequately measured. It is momentous and its good effects will reverberate for decades. There is a lesson in Father Doyle's letter. The truth is not meant to be hidden. It is not meant to be suppressed. It is not meant to be ignored. It is not meant to be disguised. It is not meant to be manipulated. It is not meant to be falsified. Otherwise, evil will prevail. Wrongdoing will persist. I tell you all this for several reasons. First, I think it's important to understand how major investigations get started, sometimes with a single case in a local courthouse. And that speaks to the need for vigorous local journalism, something that today, sadly, is not at all assured. Also, I want to point out that the press may be flawed, and in fact we are, just like any profession. But despite our flaws, I firmly believe that we are also necessary. The press has a singular role in holding powerful individuals and powerful institutions accountable at the national level, but also in our communities. And I hope the Boston Globe investigation and the movie it inspired, inspired 
causes people to appreciate the necessity of investigative reporting and appreciate what's required to do it right. It takes time, it takes money, it takes expertise, it takes doggedness and dedication. My hope is that the movie will cause media owners, media executives, and editors to rededicate themselves to investigative reporting. I cannot imagine civil society and a genuine democracy without it. In this, a presidential election year, investigative reporting is as necessary as ever. The party nominees aspire to the highest position in the most powerful country on earth. The winner will take on enormous responsibility. And the responsibility of those of us in the press is to make sure the public knows these candidates as fully as possible before votes are cast. We have an obligation to thoroughly examine them. At the Washington Post, I believe, the record will show that we have done that because the leading candidates have a lot to answer for. It is axiomatic these days that no one, especially, no one especially likes the press, least of all politicians and their most ardent supporters during an election. In the current presidential campaign, neither major party candidate has warm feelings about us. Until re relatively recently, the Democratic nominee was notoriously inaccessible, consistently ducking hard questions that deserve to be asked. Her long-standing suspicion of the press and her hostility toward it endure. As for the Republican nominee, he launched an outright assault on the press for just doing its job, making animosity toward the media a centerpiece of his campaign. He said this, I'm not running against crooked Hillary, I'm running against the crooked media. And with particular, particular irony, he attacked supposed media dishonesty while giving an interview that was to air on RT, a network controlled by the government of Russia, where a once nascent free press has been crushed and where journalists are routinely assassinated with an impunity to which the government is at least indifferent and at worst complicit. He has described the press as disgusting, scum, lowlifes. And if that wasn't enough, uh, in August he called journalists the lowest form of humanity. That wasn't enough either, by the way. He then called us the lowest form of life. Um, so we can't get any lower. <laughs> he has to stop there. That's it. He has said he wants to open up libel laws, and while it's not clear what that means, he has suggested that he would routinely torment unfriendly media outlets by suing them, driving up their legal expenses, and subjecting them to severe penalties. With respect to the Washington Post, in particular, he ordered our press credentials revoked, barring us from routine press access to him and his events, because our coverage did not meet with his approval. In one instance, a reporter seeking to attend a Wisconsin rally for his running mate, just like any ordinary citizen, was frisked by sheriff's deputies in collusion with campaign volunteers and private security staff. And then this reporter was prohibited from entering at all. The reason? Well, as he was sternly told, it was because he was a reporter for the Washington Post. The blacklist targeting of the Post and other news organizations was enforced for months, until a couple of weeks ago when it was finally ended. Months earlier, the Republican nominee falsely alleged that our owner, Jeff Bezos, was orchestrating negative coverage of him and his campaign because he fears a possible antitrust suit or tax policies that would penalize Amazon. And he's gone so far as to suggest that the Washington Post served as some sort of tax dodge, tax dodge for Amazon. All of this, of course, is false. First, Amazon, the company, doesn't even own the Washington Post. 
and our owner has exercised no influence whatsoever on our coverage. Yet the candidate has openly hinted that if he becomes president, he would seek retribution. So Jeff Bezos himself addressed this uh, perfectly, I think, some months ago, and I don't think I can say it better, so I'll just quote him here. We want a society, he said, where any of us, any individual in this country, any institution in this country, if they choose to, can scrutinize, examine, and criticize an elected official, especially a candidate for the highest office in the most powerful country on earth. It's critical. What would be shocking and disturbing is if you weren't doing that. That would be troubling. The Post has a long tradition of examining presidential candidates as it should, and there's no way that's going to change. And he added, we have fundamental laws and we have constitutional rights in this country to free speech, but that's not the whole story, and that's not the whole reason that it works here. We also have cultural norms that support that, where you don't have to be afraid of retaliation. And those cultural norms are at least as important as the Constitution." End quote. The people of the United States need to stand firmly on the side of free speech and a free press. Not solely because it is written into the First Amendment of our Constitution, although we should not forget that, uh, but because free expression is essential to a well-functioning civil society and to real democracy. The First Amendment is at the very heart of what makes our country great. In one of his most cited Supreme Court opinions, Justice Louis Brandeis in 1927 wrote this, freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means ins indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. The greatest menace to freedom, he wrote, is an inert people. Public discussion is a political duty, and this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. We as a society cannot say we stand for democracy in principle and then undermine it in practice. We cannot say we support the Constitution and then render constitutional <coughs> rights meaningless. And when it comes to the rights of its citizens, the United States should continue to be a model for others. In so much of the world now, free expression is under attack. Governments worldwide are making the work of the press harder, if not impossible, and often life-threatening. The pattern is well established. Obstruction, surveillance, intimidation, imprisonment, and at times, outright murder. Autocratic governments, along with terrorist and criminal organizations, see killing, kidnapping, maiming, and jailing reporters as all in a day's work. Now, later this month, I will speak before Latin American journalists at a conference in Medellin, Colombia. Journalists in South and Central America have been victimized by governments that show no respect for free speech, a free press, or free expression of any sort. Now, I should say that there's only one subject related to politics that I will ever discuss during an election, and that's the role of the press, its performance, its responsibilities, its obstacles, and its rights. When our work is obstructed or our rights are threatened, journalists have an obligation to speak up. We enjoy the, the gifts of the First Amendment. We have a duty to protect it. And the public should know that if the rights of the press are put at risk, the right of ordinary citizens to speak their minds is also endangered. It's worth remembering that these rights are not just to protect you and those who agree with you. They also protect those with whom you disagree. You know, there's a, a painting called Freedom of Speech. It's by Norman Rockwell, one of this country's most popular artists. Rockwell, of course, is best known for 47 years worth of cover illustrations for the old Saturday Evening Post magazine. And they captured an idealiz idealized image of small town American life. But this painting, Freedom of Speech, ranks among his more ambitious and provocative works. It has been described by 
biographer Deborah Solomon as the defining image of American democracy and progress. So what did Rockwell portray in that 1942 piece that sought to give visual definition to our First Amendment right? It was not the collective demands of the crowd. Instead, as he struggled with what to paint, what came to his mind was a lone dissenter along with his passionate remarks at a town meeting. The embodiment of the fundamental American right of free speech was, as biographer Solomon put it, an individual who isn't afraid to think for himself or to stand alone. Free expression requires tolerance for the speech of others, even if it offends us. As Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes memorably wrote in 1929, the Constitution recognizes, as he put it, freedom for the thought we hate. All these years later, that is a lesson that we still must take to heart. And it is a lesson that I hope journalism and communication students at Ohio University, all students actually, take with them when they leave this institution. We cannot take our rights for granted, and we cannot assume that our institutions, including the courts, are so strong that they will forever safeguard these rights on our behalf. The rights taken as a given today have at times been stolen from us, most notably when our country has been at war, or when the war felt imminent, or when citizens felt threatened by immigrants whose cultures were unfamiliar and whose loyalties were questioned. We have seen savage assaults on free speech in this country many times, going all the way back to the Sedition Act of 1798, signed into law by President John Adams in the face of impending war with France. Law professor Jeffrey Stone wrote about this in his really excellent 2004 book called Perilous Times, a history of wartime threats to free speech. And his words have an ominous ring today. The nation's commitment to civil liberties, he wrote, was quickly rationalized out of existence. That act declared, the Sedition Act, declared that if any person shall write, print, utter, or publish any false, scandalous, and malicious writing or writings against the government of the United States or either House of the Congress of the United States or the President of the United States with intent to defame them or to bring them into contempt or disrepute, then such person shall be punished by a fine not exceeding $2,000 and by imprisonment not exceeding two years. Now the Sedition Act, that was a lot of money back then by the way, uh, the Sedition Act reached its expiration date at the end of President Adams' term and was then abandoned, having met with ferocious, unwavering resistance from the opposing party and the antipathy of a majority of the American people. As Stone wrote, the Sedition Act of 1798 ultimately taught a critical lesson. The protection of freedom must come ultimately from the people themselves. And after the Sedition Act of 1798 came the Espionage Act of 1917, and another Sedition Act, the Sedition Act of 1918, in the context of World War I, as well as something called the Committee on Public Information, a federal propaganda machine. Stone calls that era thrust on the nation by President Wilson one of the most fiercely repressive periods in American history. And since then, we have seen similar periods of hysteria and repression where dissent has been labeled and prosecuted as incitement and treason. Perhaps nothing was worse than the McCarthy era during the Cold War with its ferocious and capricious assault on free speech and association. President Truman, not the most consistent defender of free speech himself, warned that we need not fear the expression of ideas, we do need to fear their suppression. But suppression is what we got. So it is worth remembering today what that time in our history was like. And worth remembering that safeguarding our right to free expression falls to every citizen, and especially to those of us in the press who enjoy its gifts. It's not enough to fight back when free speech has already been suppressed. We must fight to make sure that any first steps toward robbing us of our rights are never taken. Beyond efforts at intimidation, there is something at least equally insidious 
worrisome taking place in the United States. In this case, the internet is at the heart of this troubling turn of events. The internet, of course, can be a source for good, allowing freedom of expression. It also allows that expression to veer into a dark world of falsehoods and conspiracies. It allows those falsehoods and conspiracy theories to be disseminated instantly to millions of individuals. We live in an era when information consumers have almost unlimited choice, and choice is good. But in choosing, many have been drawn to media outlets that only affirm their pre-existing point of view and never challenge it. Most concerning, though, is this. Many of these outlets deliver to their readers their listeners and their viewers, purported facts that are, in actuality, falsehoods. Ideologically driven internet outlets have propagated the notion that someone other than Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda was responsible for the attacks of 9-11. Perhaps the US government, perhaps Jews, perhaps Israelis. They maintain that the president was not born in the United States, even though all evidence shows he was, and no evidence shows he was not. One-fifth, one-fifth of Americans believe he was born outside the country, even though he was born in Hawaii. And 29% believe he's Muslim, even though he's Christian. These media outlets spread the notion that last year's military training exercise, Jade Helm, Operation Jade Helm, was an administration plan to crack down on civil liberties and a prelude to a military takeover, even though, of course, it was not. One radio host, also the operator of a popular internet site, has spread the notion that some mass shootings were a hoax, that the 2012 killing of 20 children and seven adults at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, was a hoax designed to boost public support for gun control. And the same he claims is true for the San Bernardino shooting last December that left 14 people dead. Parents of a six-year-old boy murdered at Sandy Hook Elementary School wrote last year of their grief and the harassment they had received from these conspiracy theories. Here's what they said. The heartache of burying a child is a sorrow we would not wish upon anyone. Yet to our horror, we have found that there are some in this society who lack empathy for the suffering of others. Among them are the conspiracy theorists that deny our tragedy was real. They seek us out and accuse us of being government agents who are faking our grief and lying about our loss. Fact-checking by mainstream media outlets has little to no effect. We are objects of suspicion, and our work is met with resistance or outright rejection. And to make matters worse, politicians exploit fabrications to advance their own agendas. Some repeat the lies. The silence of others serves as a tacit endorsement. Some validate conspiracy theorists by granting them interviews and speaking approvingly in general terms of their work. The result? People believe a lot that is plainly, demonstrably untrue. Many people. And it is having a corrosive effect. How can we have a strong civil society when we can't agree on basic facts? How can we have a functioning democracy when people accept lies as fact? Columnist Ann Applebaum wrote about this recently in the Washington Post, and she described the stakes with bracing directness. Here's what she said. In countries, and they're more than you think, where reputable, fact-checked, independent media don't function, because they're too expensive, because the internet destroyed the advertising market, because illiberal governments put pressure on the media, then the possibility of civilized conversation disappears too. If different versions of the truth appear in different online versions, if no one can agree upon what actually happened yesterday, if fake, manipulated, or mendacious news websites are backed up by mobs of internet trolls, then conspiracy theories, whether of the far left or far right, will soon have the same weight as reality. Politicians who lie will be backed by a clack of supporters. Now this can be a particular threat 
to the world's weak democracies and its poor democracies. But as Applebaum noted, it is fast becoming a problem for rich democracies like ours. It is now possible, as Applebaum noted, to live in a virtual reality where lies are acclaimed as the hidden truth. For all the challenges that we face in media today, technology, money, this is the greatest challenge we face. It's greater than that financial challenge, greater than our technology challenge. It is why we as journalists must stay faithful to our central purpose. We may be objects of suspicion. Our fact-checking may not be embraced. But someone must still tell things as they really are. And we can't be shy about it. Amid all the talk about how we as journalists must be fair, and yes, we must, above all, I think about, I think about our obligation to be fair to the public. We must be honest, honorable, and accurate in our reporting. But we must also be unafraid to tell people what we've really learned and to tell it to them straight. To me, that's what it means to be fair to the public and what it means to be respectful of the truth. With good reason this year, one of our columnists, George Will, was motivated by the political environment to quote the poet James Russell Lowell. Lowell wrote this in 1845. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. In the strife of truth with falsehood, for the good or evil side. Now that strife of truth with falsehood continues to this day. So the decision is ours, the good or evil side. Thank you for listening. Thanks for mentioning that. That's good. <laughs> I wanted to know what your thought was on that anyway. Right. I've been asked that. Uh, so uh, I was anticipating that question, um, <laughs> oddly enough. Um, you know, I don't make it a habit. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't comment on post editorials, um, uh, no matter how tempted I might be to comment on them. Uh, I will say that. Um, you know, that when we won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service for the work we did on uh, the NSA and the documents that were revealed by Snowden, I said that it was public service, uh, an important uh, illumination of this, um, this issue that, that I think put into sharp relief the, the balance between national security and individual privacy. And I talked uh, with I considerable pride uh, about how our work had, and um, had exposed a sort of pervasive and intrusive uh, surveillance system that had been put in, pla put in place by the U.S. government without, um, without public debate. I stand by those statements. Right. Well, thanks for mentioning Waypoint. It is really cool. It's video, totally video driven. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, it is a, um, it's a video driven uh, presentation of the refugee crisis in Europe. Uh, it's mobile first, uh, so you, it's great on the, tel on the, on the smartphone. Uh, you know, we're trying a lot of things like that. In fact, we're just open to people's imagination for how we can, how we can do things. Uh, we're, we will try some things. Some, some will work, some won't work, but uh, we, 
we recognize that people are getting information in different ways. Uh, we don't feel uh, bound by the traditional way of presenting the information. We only feel bound by what's the most effective way to engage, uh, engage people. And if the best storytelling approach is uh, using video or using interactive graphics or what have you, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do that. So what we really do, I can't really say, well, this is next. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're looking at uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and 360-degree video, uh, which are all sometimes sort of mushed together to say virtual reality, but it's not all virtual reality. But uh, So we're looking at that. Uh, but I don't want to say that's the best because often it's not the best. It's just the most expensive. Uh, so um, uh, there may be actually better ways of telling the story. And so we're looking for whatever is the best. We have these incredible tools that are available to us today. And we don't want to just use them to show that we know how to use the cool new toys. We want to use them to tell the story in the best possible way. So when we approach a story, inevitably there are many, many people who are involved, our graphics people, our video people, our uh, audience engagement team, you name it. And so we uh, enlist all of them and sort of coming up with what's the, what's the, best, what's the best approach. Um, well, it's tough to talk about in the abstract, so, um, uh, which is often the answer I give when I don't necessarily want to give an answer, but, um, <laughs> um, but, um, but I, th look, I mean, I think that you have to stand up for what you, uh, believe. Uh, I think you have to tell people, I would think through, I would not, when you, if you argue with the boss, and I've certainly, uh, been on the receiving end of that, um, the, and I've also, been on the delivering end of that, uh, I think you have to make sure that you're not just being emotional, you have to make sure you've thought through what the argument is and why it's a bad idea. Uh, and, uh, and think through how you want to say it. And that's, what I, that's the point that I would make to you is just don't do it, don't do it on impulse. Uh, think through what it is you want to say and why you want to say it and how you want to say it and then go in and say it uh, and register an objection. I think that you are uh, not always a, you're not only always you're not only entitled to do it you're obligated to do that uh, now you may not win the you may not win the battle uh, but um, and then you get to decide what you want to do so um, and a lot of it is you know well how problematic is it really uh, so how big an offense is it in your estimation so um, you know those those incidents do occur for sure um, but you have to think it through and that's what I would do, is just pause for a moment, think through what it is, maybe more than a moment, and think through what it is you want to say, and then figure out how you want to say it, and then say it. Well, I didn't decide to go into inv investigative journalism. I decided to go into journalism, and um, so, um, and investigative journalism was more an outgrowth of some of what was when I was a reporter, which you know, was not that long a period of time, but also when I was an editor and my uh, desire for us to tell the most interesting and most impactful stories, and uh, the stories that mattered the most. I mean, that's the objective. And, um, and, um, and so, but into journalism, you know, I grew up in a, my family was from uh, overseas. They came to the United States uh, three months before I was born. Uh, they were really interested in what was happening around the world and in this con new country of theirs. And so we had the, this uh, habit in the household of uh, getting the newspaper every morning, uh, watching the nightly news, which is something that people used to do. Um, <laughs> and they would watch, you know, we'd watch the local news first and then uh, on would come the national news a half hour later and it would be, we would watch the, what was known as the Huntley Brinkley Report uh, on NBC. And uh, then they would get Time Magazine um, once a week and it was just a, a regular diet of that in our household. And we traveled a lot as a family around the world. Around, around the world. And, um, and so I was, became really interested in public affairs and, and news and how, how those subjects were, were, were um, discussed. And so that's what got me into it. But as I got into it, I just became really interested in looking for the deeper story, uh, telling the story that 
uh, that uh, holds people to account. Uh, and I think part of that is I always hated, uh, I always hated elites and things like that, and I just couldn't stand it, elitism. And part of that was probably the high school I went to where there were a lot of people from the elites. And I didn't really hate them personally, but I hated sort of this feeling of entitlement. And I, there were friend, many friends there, but, but uh, I think, I don't know, I can't remember their names, but the, um, um, they, um, they uh, I just, I hated that sense of entitlement and, uh, and privilege, and, and so I, um, I think that stuck with me. Um, you, you talked about how when you were younger, you know, your family read the newspapers, read the, to uh, the Times, uh, read or watched the nightly news. Now so often in our society, it seems like people are getting their news from almost entertainment sources. So how is it, as you, uh, for you as an executive editor, um, do you get people to consume stories that are actually meaningful and important uh, for them to form their opinions, especially like at a time in this election cycle? Whereas instead of you know taking those rumors about how Obama is sure. Islamic, or how you know, uh, or, or just different random stories like that, and mm -hmm. actually reading the truth and reading stories that are significant. Yeah. Well, look, we recognize that people are not getting information in the way that we just want them to. We would prefer that they like go out and buy a newspaper and read it cover to cover. Lo and behold, people don't do that. So, um, and so uh, they don't even necessarily come to our website directly. So uh, they're not like, going to the Washington Post and going from the home page and navigating to a story and coming back to the home page and navigating to the next story. Only journalists think that they do that. Uh, so uh, traditional journalists at least. But now you know, people know that they're coming to the story first. And how are they getting to the story first? Well, typically they're getting to the story first from social media, uh, uh, typically Facebook, uh, which is incredibly powerful. And, but there are others. I mean, they get it through Google search or Twitter or Reddit or you name it, any of the other uh, social media sites out there, including many that are new. And um, so, uh, and typically they're on a, on a smartphone when they're uh, doing that. So uh, more than half the people who come to our site, come to our digital work are coming from a smartphone. And typically they're coming frequently by social media. So, um, so we have to keep that in mind. And so that means that we have to write, uh, when we put headlines on stories, we make them really interesting. Uh, we really work at it. Uh, and we don't make them clickbait. They're not, it's not clickbait, there's a lot of substance there. And we don't make them inaccurate. We just make them accurate and interesting.